Um, now I'm going to uh, turn our attention to our keynote speakers. Um, <clears throat> it's my honor to induce, uh, introduce two keynote speakers, uh, Professor uh, Pim Kuypers and Dr. Ken Carswell. Since Professor Kuypers and Dr. Carswell are both located in Europe, they have provided us with pre-recorded lectures that we will now share. So each of them will join us live at 2.30 uh, China Standard Time to engage in an open discussion and we'll field questions at that time. So please, as you're you know, watching their keynote address, note questions and things you would like to pose to them uh, for a discussion later. Um, so I'll first introduce uh, our, our first uh, speaker. Our first uh, keynote speaker is Professor Pim Kuypers, who will present scalable digital interventions for depression uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, professor Kuypers is a professor of clinical psychology at the Brie University of uh, Amsterdam in the Netherlands and director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Research and Dissemination of Psychological Interventions in Amsterdam. He is specialized in conducting randomized control trials and meta-analysis on prevention and psycho uh, psychological interventions uh, for common mental disorders across the lifespan. Uh, much of his work is aimed at prevention of mental disorders, uh, psychological treatments of depression, anxiety disorders, and internet delivered treatments. Uh, Pim Kuypers has published over a thousand peer reviewed uh, papers, chapters, reports, and professional publications, including almost 800 papers in international peer reviewed scientific journals. Uh, he's also um, a Thomson Reuters Web of Science uh, listed highly cited researcher uh, since the first edition was published in 2014. Uh, and the second most highly cited researcher in the field of psychology and psychiatry. So we are very delighted and honored uh, uh, to feature him in our meeting today. Um, I will now share, um, share my screen and we will uh, watch his lecture together. Hi everyone. My name is Ben Kuypers. I'm a professor of clinical psychology at the Free University in Amsterdam. And uh, it's too bad I cannot be with you in person because that would have been much more fun. That's because of COVID, uh, we're still in a lockdown. And so that's not possible. So I recorded my presentation of this morning also because for me, uh, the lecture is in the middle of the night. So, I will be available to discuss my lecture later on during uh, the conference, but now you will be listening to me uh, to this pre-recorded session. So I hope you uh, forgive me that I'm not with you today. Uh, so what I will do, I will start now sharing my screen so that you can see my uh, slides. Here they are. Yes, this is how it should look like. So what I will talk about today is about digital interventions on, for mental health with a focus on the uh, pandemic. And what I will do in my lecture is I will first talk about depression, the pandemic, and psychological treatments. And I'll try to say something about where we are and where we're heading. Then I will talk about psychological treatments of depression in general. And my message will be that it won't, I mean, psychological treatments are effective, whether or not that's COVID-19 related. And maybe prevalence has gone up a little because of the pandemic. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't have a real uh, consequence for the effectiveness or that we should make psychological treatments available uh, because the majority of people don't seek treatment at all. When I talked about psychological treatments of depression in general, I will switch to internet interventions. And I will show you that if we, have digital interventions that these that the effects of these interventions are comparable to those of face-to-face -face interventions. There's good science supporting that statement. At least when there is some human support to do that. And I will come back to that later. But the, the this knowledge that internet or digital interventions are effective. That's mostly from efficacy studies. 
And we will have to do a lot of research examining how and where, in which settings, populations, can we apply that knowledge that digital interventions are effective. And that's where much research is needed. And I will give you a few examples of projects I've been involved in in the past years uh, that examine this, yeah, these opportunities that digital interventions give. And then finally, I will uh, say a few words about the future. So first, COVID. Uh, uh, first, depression. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I I don't have the time to go into that uh, too much. Uh, but it is a highly prevalent disorder with 300 million people worldwide suffering from depression. And the majority in East and South Asia, because that's where the uh, most of the people live. And so in China, India, Indonesia, uh, that's where the large populations <laughs> are. And in Europe, it, I mean, a lot of countries are focused on depression within their own country. But I always say that there are more people, more depressed people in China than the total population of Spain altogether. And that's, that brings the whole issue into perspective. But it's not only a highly, highly prevalent disorder. It's also the incidence is very high. So every year, a lot of new people get depressed. For me, that's an important reason to focus more on uh, prevention. But also, if you look at the consequences for the quality of life of people suffering from depression, the impact is, is very high. And that means that on a population level, the burden of disease is really very high. And uh, it's increasing, not, not because the prevalence is increasing, but mostly because of population growth and changing ages uh, within the populations. But um, because depression is also a, um, a, a disorder affecting people in their working age, that the economic costs are so high. So not only the disease burden, but also the economic costs. And that's not because of treatment costs, but because of production losses. Uh, well, I don't have time to go into that, but that's a very, that's an essential thing. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you look at the consequences of COVID for mental health in general, the basic message is that we still don't know very much. So there is a lot of research. I will show, show you some results from a living systematic review on the consequences of COVID for mental health. But if we think about the consequences of COVID for mental health, that's not one thing. It's a multi-dimensional uh, uh, thing. And I, I took this just as, a, as, a, uh, as an illustration from the recent World Happiness Report so that uh, over time, the consequences will change uh, the consequences of the pandemic. So at the beginning, there was this immediate fear and anxiety and the direct responses to lockdown that people were suddenly isolated. Um, but then adversities came up. Uh, what, what happened to people with existing mental disorders? What happened to people who got uh, uh, COVID? So then you, you saw that, that there were responses to adversities related to the pandemic. And then um, over the longer term, you see that the mental health support was, uh, that, that was needed, but we don't know how that affected mental health. And then we will, we can expect that on the longer term, there will be economic consequences, uh, unrest, poverty, unemployment, which we know are related to mental health. So if we think about the consequences of COVID for mental health, that's not one thing. That's a whole range of possibilities and uh, yeah, different kinds of effects we have to think about. Um, and I want to, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of research on COVID and mental health. 
that's exploding. I don't know if you're involved in journals, in, in editing journals, but many journals I am involved in, they have seen an increase of often more than 50% of new papers and in, in 2020. And most of these papers are on COVID. And that's also on COVID and mental health. So the, the research on COVID and mental health is exploding. And I really like this project the, uh, for, led by Brad Thoms in uh, Canada, which is a living systematic review. So they continuously update new research on uh, the pandemic and, uh, uh, and, and mental health. And what they do is they, they, they don't include all studies because that's impossible because it's so, so big. And what they do is they only include studies in which uh, there was one measurement before COVID and another after the start of COVID because that says something about the change in prevalence. Uh, because if you just look into uh, a, a, a cross-sectional studies among people and you see whether you, you examine whether they, they're depressed, that doesn't say very much because you don't know if it has increased or decreased uh, compared to pre-COVID. So that's what I like about this project and what they uh, now, when you have looked at it last week, and they have now 35 studies included with measures before and after COVID-19, 17 were on the general populations, 12 were really big with more than 1,000 participants. And what you, you, what you see in most of these studies is that these population studies they show either small increases or negligible changes, especially in anxiety, but study, some studies also in depression. They also look at randomized controlled trials on mental health, uh, in, on mental health problems uh, related to COVID, but that's not uh, really, yeah, that's really, there is not mm, enough knowledge what yeah, what, what these interventions say about the effects because there are only a few trials uh, have finished. But in general, we can say, okay, depression, uh, but also anxiety was already a big problem. And um, maybe this has increased a little because of COVID. And I do think that one of the most important consequences of COVID is that most people now understand how important mental health is. So it's how important it is that we focus our societies on mental health because it's so fragile. And many people don't develop a major depressive disorder, but they do feel down and isolated and lonely. And so it makes it clear that, that mental health is a very important aspect of everybody's life. And it probably it doesn't affect the prevalence in the general population very much. I mean, probably there are subpopulations that are affected, like uh, young people, children, adolescents, uh, students, uh, people affected by COVID, relatives of people who have died because of COVID, the, the healthcare populations. I mean, Gen preferences in the general population don't say anything about these subpopulations. But overall, on a population level, probably prevalence rates are not very much affected. Maybe a little more, but the, the existing problems of depression, namely that treatments are affected, but not that effective, that many people don't seek treatment. Uh, that many people who are treated successfully uh, relapse again after a while. I mean, that kind of problems are, yeah, they are, they're still there, so to say. And maybe they're a bit more intense because of COVID. But the, the, the major problem is that we, yeah, that depression, uh, it's not that COVID has changed depression that much. But the, 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 the actual problems of depression were so big already. 
So uh, you can, I, I, I dare to say that general approaches to the treatment of depression and anxiety are also valid when mental health problems are related to COVID-19. Um, and I, I, I think I can say that because we have done a lot of research of psychological treatments for depression in specific populations like people uh, with uh, general medical disorders, with perinatal uh, depression, in older adults, in younger adults, in college students, uh, in people who are unemployed. And what you usually see is that treatments are just effective in these populations. Uh, that's not completely true. Um, I hope I have the time to come back to that later. But overall, you can say that treatments are also effective in specific populations. So why would that not be effective in uh, when mental health problems are related to COVID-19? So I think we can just use mood, mood management tools so we can adapt them for COVID-19. But overall, we can expect that these are just as effective as they are for depression, which is not COVID related. So we developed a few um, interventions for COVID. Um, and what we do is we just take the usual module, so to say, uh, which are used for mood management interventions. Uh, and we, 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 we add them to our uh, uh, digital interventions. Uh, for uh, aimed at COVID. We, we also, for co in college students, we uh, developed a specific COVID-related uh, intervention, in which we try to use a somewhat different approach, very brief uh, on, on aspects which are related to depression, but not directly, like in students, procrastination is an important problem. And we have brief modules for procrastination for time planning, for cognitive restructuring, and students can choose what they want. So, and uh, uh, the, the evaluations of this are pretty positive, but it's not very different from what we did already in other interventions. So now I will go to psychological treatments of depression in general. And so, um, I'm, uh, I'm looking at the time, I'm, so, one of the basic, if you want to, one of the basic problems of treatments of depression is that they're not that effective. And we always say to people that they are, that treatments are effective, evidence-based, and people should try to get treatments and because that's important. But if you really look at the effects of treatments, there are some problems. And I wrote a paper, a, a viewpoint paper about this in JAMA uh, two years ago. Not everybody was very happy with this, uh, but what I what it basically says is that yeah, if you if you give people a treatment, then uh, quite a few people get better. Uh, the response rates are fifty to sixty percent after antidepressants or psychotherapy. Um, but when you look at placebo rates or people in care as usual conditions, a lot of them also get better. And you don't see that as a clinician. You won't only think, okay, my treatment is very effective because a lot of people get better. Uh, but in fact, a lot of them would have gotten better also without your treatment. And that's that's bias that, uh, that, that you cannot avoid when you work in clinical practice. But if you look at the numbers, for example, in uh, antidepressant medication, 54% uh, of people get better if they get uh, respond when they get antidepressant medication, but that's 38% in placebo. So the additional effect of drugs is 16%. 16% of people who get antidepressants get better because of the antidepressant. That's also true for psychotherapies. And I, and it, of course, there's a, you can say a lot about this research, and I, uh, we certainly should do that. But overall, you can say, okay, let's say that 20% of people get better because of our treatments. That still means that a lot of people get better without our treatments. And a lot of people on the other side don't respond at all. 
And uh, uh, of course, you can go on and try new treatments, et cetera, et cetera. But there is this large group of patients who don't respond to anything. So on the one hand, a lot of people get better without treatment. On the other hand, there are a lot of people who don't respond to any treatment. And our interventions actually work in the middle group that, that do respond to treatment. Uh, yeah, okay, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's important to realize when we talk about the effects of uh, therapies. And so I will um, uh, talk a lot, a lot about meta-analysis. Uh, if you wanna learn meta-analysis, look at my personal website. You can download a free uh, uh, hands-on guide on how to do meta-analysis. Um, you, you can also, you also find a link to a free hands-on book to, uh, uh, to run meta-analysis in R, uh, written by Matthias Hara. And for each of the steps of the meta-analysis, uh, research question, uh, literature search, meta-analysis, et cetera, et cetera, I have recorded YouTube videos. And if you wanna learn meta-analysis, you can find everything there. You can also look at our website, uh, metapsi.org, uh, where you can run your own meta-analysis without any software. So we have all our studies on psychotherapies for depression online. You can make, uh, on this website, you can make online selections of uh, studies and then run online a meta-analysis yourself without any software. So if you want to know whether CBT is effective in older adults, select the studies on that and you will find, you can run the meta-analysis directly. Is psychotherapy effective in East Asia? Just run the analysis uh, online there. So um, uh, yeah, I, I won't go into details about how we do meta-analysis uh, because that's, that goes, uh, beyond the scope of this lecture. What is important is that, that I will show you effect sizes, but that's very difficult to interpret from a clinical uh, perspective. So it means that the treatment group and the control group uh, differ in terms of standard deviation. So an effect size of 0.5 says that after treatment, the treatment and the control group differ 0.5 standard deviations from each other. And that's very difficult to explain to a patient who just wants to know how good it is a, is a treatment. And so I also get numbers needed to be treated. How many people do you need to treat in order to have one more positive outcome than no treatment or than an alternative treatment? And so an effect size of 0.5 corresponds with the numbers needed to be treated of six. Well, this is the number of studies on psychotherapy for adult depression. And uh, you, what you see is that until the mid 1990s, most research was done in the United States. Since then, Europe is catching up. Now there's as much research in Europe as in the United States. But since 2000, we see that also other countries are coming up. And since 2010, we see that, especially in East Asia, the number of studies is rising quickly. Overall, we see a steep increase of the number of trials on psychotherapies over time. And so we don't see this uh, increase slowing down. So every year it, it gets more work to, uh, uh, to keep our database updated. So we now have more than 800 randomized trials in our database. We're now working on the new update. And we, we, we have all these different comparisons of psychotherapies versus control groups, different kinds of psychotherapies. Uh, we have direct comparisons between types of therapies, uh, comparisons with psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy with combined treatments. Uh, we have uh, comp direct comparisons between individual and group, between individual and face to uh, sorry, internet treatment, et cetera, et cetera. So we have all these comparisons. We have a lot of trials. So I, I will try to summarize that without, but I have to be quickly. Uh, I will try, I will skip some of this because it's it's all too much. These are the effects of different 
types of psychotherapies for depression. What you can see is that they're pretty effective. And that's for, for all the types of psychotherapies that are examined in at least random, 10 randomized trials. And that ranges from CBT, which is definitely the best studied type of therapy, but also behavioral activation, uh, psychodynamic therapy, the new third wave therapies, but also, for example, live review therapy in older adults. That's also quite a lot of research on that. Depends on the type of control group, what the effects are. The waiting lists probably overestimate the effects compared to care as usual or the placebo control groups. Um, and so this is just to get a general overview. And I will now switch to what we know about internet interventions, because that's what we're talking about. And they, they have all kinds of advantages, which are obvious. Yeah, you know, uh, they're cheaper, safe traveling time, no waiting list, you can work on your own time, etc. There are some danger and disadvantages. It's probably not good for everyone. Not that, internet is not available for everyone. Diagnosis from a distance is complicated, etc. But the most important thing is, are they effective? And are they eff as effective as face-to-face -face therapies? And so this begins with comparisons between types of therapies. And I will explain you later why that's important. So there is a lot of research directly comparing different types of psychotherapies with each other. And this is from a paper we published a long time ago in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology with all, all direct comparisons. So CBT versus all other therapies, psychodynamic, you understand it. And effect sizes, if there are zero, or not significant, then there is no evidence that a therapy is more effective than another one. And here you can see that most research was done at that time on CBT, and that there was not a significant difference between CBT and other therapies. We also didn't find other therapies to be more or less effective than other therapies, except for IPT, interpersonal psychotherapy, that was a little more effective and other therapies, but we couldn't replicate that later. So that's probably just a chance finding. We also found that supportive therapy was a little less effective than other therapies, but that's also because supportive counseling is often used as a control condition. And it's very well possible that that's just an article, that that's just because in the control conditions, the therapist didn't deliver the, the counseling as a real therapy, so to say. So maybe that's an artifact of outcomes. We did, this, did that a couple of years later with the Swiss group, a network meta-analysis of 200 studies in which we compare, in which we included all types of psychotherapies with control conditions, but also comparing therapies with each other. And we found basically the same thing no significant difference between therapies. We have updated this meta-analysis just now. It's in press in World Psychiatry, so it will be published later this year. What we find is we, we, we were much more rigorous, better methods, better inclusion criteria, more rigorous definitions of everything, no strange control groups, only care as usual, weightless placebo. And we basically found the same thing. All therapies have comparable effects, except for counseling, but that may be another thing. And then we get to the Dodebert verdict, which, which is an old discussion. You can go back into the literature and you will, you will see um, that, that, that that discussion goes back to the 1970s, whether all psychotherapies are equally effective. And it comes from Alice in Wonderland, where Alice and her friend are having a contest and they were, they're running through each other. Uh, and then at some point, the dodo bird says, uh, okay, everyone, the contest is over. And then Alice asks, yes, but who has won? And then the dodo bird says, everybody has won and all should have prizes. And this, this, is, this is why this is uh, still, this, that's where the story comes from. If you look at the literature, you will see that a lot of papers have been written about it. 
And, uh, but actually, we don't know. I won't go, I won't go into this in too much detail. Um, and there are alternative explanations, and we, we don't know how therapies work. So we also don't know whether this is all using the same mechanisms. But what is important in this is that if these therapies have comparable effects, can we not reduce the, them? Can we not take parts of it out and minimize them? So uh, and while they're still as effective. And um, this question, how can we minimize treatments without reducing the effects? That's where internet interventions come, come in. So it's not, uh, not, it's not only internet interventions that do this. You can also minimize interventions in other ways. But here for us now today, that it's important that we focus on, okay, do we need this individual format of 16 individual one hour sessions for therapies to be effective? No, that's not needed. And we did another network meta-analysis, which was published in 2019 in JAMA Psychiatry. We only look at CDP, and we had 155 studies with 15,000 patients, and we included all studies on individual CBT, group to CBT, telephone CBT, guided self-help, which included, uh, includes internet-based interventions, unguided self-help, all through the internet. And we include it as comparators, waiting list, parish usual, and placebo. So everything, all comparisons between these nodes were included. And then you get these nice uh, network plots where, where you can see uh, how many participants were included, how many studies were included in each of the comparisons. And what we basically found is that the effects do not significantly differ from each other when you use group therapy, telephone, individual, guided self-help, that really doesn't matter. If unguided self-help, uh, if you look at unguided self-help, that was, that was less effective than the, 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 all the interventions with some kind of human involvement. Um, there is one thing that is important to say, and that's the dropout rates were higher in guided self. -help. So if you work with digital interventions, you, re you have to give some support because then you can expect comparable effects, but you have to be careful for dropout because that is higher than a face-to-face -face intervention. Do we need to work, if you work with digital interventions, does that have to be CBT? Because by far the majority of interventions are based on CBT. No, that's not needed. CBT is useful because it's very psychoeducational. That's a lot of elements that you um, uh, explain uh, why, uh, uh, where depression comes from, homework assignments, how, uh, how thinking works, how acting works, or how you behave. So it's a lot of psychoeducation. But you can also use psycho, uh, psychodynamic therapies and interpersonal psychotherapies. And this is a, an, a, an example of a study we did with our Swedish colleagues on psychodynamic guided self -help. And it works just as well. Um, who gives, who are the coaches? Well, usually, so we in our trials, we only give weekly emails by coaches that cost up to 20 minutes per week. And these interventions are six, sometimes eight interventions. So the time that you need to invest as a coach is not very much. You also don't need full trained psychotherapists or a clinical psychologists. We use trained master students. And they get a certificate for psychological well-being practitioner, which was developed in the United Kingdom, where they work on a, in the IAP program in a step care model, where everybody, in principle, everybody first gets guided self-help. Uh, 
And so the first step, this guide itself, that was not delivered by fully trained coaches, but by psychological well-being professionals. So, okay. Uh, I, 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 will, I will have to go quickly, but what I try to show you is that in principle, that uh, uh, internet interventions, digital interventions are effective in the treatment and prevention of depression. But how can we apply that? And if you look at it from that perspective, you can look at it in all kinds of different ways and formats and target groups. And you can, you can use it as indicated prevention for people with subpressional depression. You can organize independent treatment centers without a physical location nationwide. Uh, you can integrate it in primary care where GPs can prescribe internet interventions. You can use it in specialized mental health care. You can use it in hospitals for general medical care. You can use it in schools and colleges at the workplace. You can build up an infrastructure for uh, guided and unguided interventions in low and middle income countries. So there, there are all kinds of ways how we can apply the knowledge that digital interventions are effective. But we have to do randomized trials in each of these settings to see whether it indeed works in these settings. And I will go very quickly through some projects using these e-health approaches. And I'm running out of time, so I have to be quickly. So one example, this is a paper we published in JAMA in 2016, where we recruited people with subpressional depression. So we did a diagnostic interview and excluded people with major depressive disorder. And we included only people who had depressive symptoms, but no depressive disorder. And then one year later, we did an, another diagnostic interview to see how many people developed a depressive disorder. And what we found is that the incidence of major depression was significantly lower in the intervention group compared to the care as usual control group. So it seems to be, seems to be possible to prevent the onset of mental disorders in subpressional depression through internet interventions. This is not about, this is another project, not about um, uh, um, depression, but about uh, acrophobia, fear of heights. Uh, this was published, led by my colleague, Tara Donkert, and I show it because it's with virtual reality, and it's just an app on fear of heights. And you can, uh, what I think is interesting about this is that you, you use it through your smartphone. So you have these Google card boxes, uh, they cost almost nothing. And you put your phone in it and then you have a VR uh, glass, so to say. And so, uh, and then you can run VR apps and uh, it's unguided. And I, that's also one of the interesting thing. And it's, it's, you go into the virtual reality app and you, you go into a theater and you can use the elevator yourself to, and then you just do exposure. That's the basic uh, idea. Uh, and that you can go stepwise, uh, increase your fear level. Uh, that's how you reduce your fear. And you, here you stand on the, on the, on the, the roof of the, of the theater and look down. And we, I mean, this was effective too. compared to a wait list, uh, but the effects were pretty large, unguided. The, the final thing uh, I wanna uh, talk to you about is individual patient data and analysis, um, because um, uh, we, we, we don't, individual trials don't have enough statistical power to examine who benefits from which treatment because trials are powered to examine um, uh, if a treatment works, not for whom it works. So if you wanna examine for whom a treatment works, you have to include, include much more patients in a trial. And 
these trials are not done because they are too expensive and too large. So what you can do is you can uh, you can collect all the primary data from randomized trials and then pool them into one big data set. And then you do have enough uh, data to examine predictors of outcome. And I will go through this quickly because of time. Uh, we published several papers about this separately for guided and for unguided internet interventions. But I will go through, yeah, what's also important is that you, that you can also look at deterioration. But I will, this is the recent paper uh, led by uh, my colleague Irini Kariotaki, which was published in JAMA Psychiatry. And it's an individual patient data network meta-analysis. And what it's, um, then you, so all the trials comparing internet intervention, unguided interventions with control conditions, guided interventions with control conditions, and the trials comparing guided with unguided interventions directly were included in the study. So um, uh, we included, um, uh, we had a large data set. I'm, I'm, I don't know, sorry, I, I forgot to write down the, the total number, but it was a huge uh, meta-analysis. And this is the most interesting thing. So we found all kinds of predictors and moderators, and I made a screenshot of this. I hope you can see it, but we found this is how you can identify for an individual patient who benefits from guided and who benefits from unguided interventions. And if you go to this website, you can, in the left side of the screen, you can fill in baseline severity, age, gender, relationship status, employment status. These are the significant predictors. And then for an individual patient, you can estimate how that patient will do in guided and in unguided interventions compared to parish usually. And what we found here is that for people with lower severity levels of depression and baseline, unguided interventions work just as well as guided interventions. And that's really very important because this will allow to separate people who can benefit from unguided intervention compare or if they really need a coach and then that will be yeah that will save so much time and, and um, uh, of coaches and money that we can spend on other things so i think this is really a game changer and the major way forward to personalized uh, treatments uh, of depression as I said, you can also look at um, uh, deterioration rates because that's a rare outcome. But in IPD meta analysis, we have those outcomes, but I don't have the time to go into this. I do find it interesting, important to say that not, I mean, these are the nice studies published in high impact journals, but a lot of trials also have failed. And that's also important to know. Not everything works if you do digital interventions. We've done, you know, trials in which we uh, gave people internet interventions while they were on a waiting list for specialized mental health care, assuming that lots of them wouldn't need uh, the treatment anymore when it's their turn, or that at least the number of sessions afterwards was reduced. Doesn't happen. That's not uh, that. It's not how it works. We developed an internet intervention for Turkish people living in the Netherlands. It didn't have significant effects. We did one in uh, uh, as a preventive trial in employees. It didn't work. So it's not everything works. But briefly about the future. Uh, well, I always like to show this picture that's from a newspaper from the 1950s. Uh, showing how they thought a computer would look like in 50 years. And uh, that's, I think that's pretty funny, uh, be, especially because, uh, you know, they thought that this is how a home computer would look like. And they thought people would have this uh, at home 
of course, what you have now on your smartphone is endless times uh, more intelligence than what you can than what you can see. And this says that you shouldn't make predictions about the future. That's the most important lesson. But of course, we the we can now see that um, uh, internet interventions they started 20 years ago. The first trials were published 20 years ago, but they were in a way very old-fashioned. They were face-to-face -face interventions put on the computer, not in a cell phone book, but on a computer, and then you had some things you could do with it. But of course, this is all moving to mobile phones and to, to uh, the, the, the mobile revolution, so to say, which gives a lot of new opportunities. And so and basically, we also develop these internet interventions as a copy of face-to-face -face interventions. But smartphones give the op opportunities to develop completely new ways of delivering interventions because you have real-time data. You have the phone always with you. You can measure things real time in your real life, which is not possible in the old fashioned digital interventions. So, so this will be a revolution. The number of trials is increasing, but the effects of just apps are still very small. And we really have to make them better, so to say, but that's the challenge for the next few years. And although it has been going on for some time, for a couple of years now, I haven't seen major game changers which increase the effects of therapies. But that is a pro that is a promise we have, together with the big data uh, on the internet and machine learning techniques. But it, we haven't seen it. Yet. So I I'm, I'm gonna stop here because I I talk too much anyway. So I want to thank you for your attention. If you have questions, ask them later on during the conference when I'm present. Uh, I will be just awake, so uh, please not do difficult questions right away. Uh, but if you want to know more about me and about the projects I'm doing, you can also look at my personal website. And I thank you for your attention. Um, yeah, that was a wonderful, uh, wonderful talk. It's too bad he's not here to uh, receive our applause, uh, but I'm sure he'll be looking forward to uh, uh, discussing uh, this and more with us later. Um, you know, I think the, the talk really helps us to gain a more global perspective on mental health and the mental health consequences of the pandemic, um, and also highlights uh, opportunities um, for digital mental health interventions. I think we're in a, in a really interesting moment and in time to pivot and start thinking about how technology can really be utilized uh, to deliver interventions at scale. And you know, the, the one thing that I was struck by in, in the talk uh, was that vulnerable populations are disproportionately affected. So the general population, at least from the data that we have now, isn't necessarily affected uh, by COVID-19 and the pandemic, but subpopulations, groups of people who are historically disadvantaged or you know, don't have access to the same opportunities in healthcare and mental health uh, services, uh, those that are often uh, neglected uh, or forgotten are disproportionately affected. And I think digital mental health interventions are potentially uh, key opportunities uh, to attempt to address their mental health needs. Um, in particular, and so I think um, we're going to learn about some of those types of programs this afternoon in our in our panel uh, studies uh, but the COVID-19 pandemic has replicated inequalities in mental health treatment uh, and access to care and I think that it presents us with a unique opportunity and a challenge uh, to think uh, think beyond uh, beyond this moment and how we could do better uh, in the future. <clears throat>